Thank you, Shami. It is an honor to be introduced by you. Thank you for all of your courageous and wonderful work. I also want to thank Jude Kelly. It's so good to be back at the South Bank Center. Uh, and Jacqueline Rose for extending the original invitation. And I wish to acknowledge that with us here tonight is Miriam Saeed, who shared her life with Edward, was his great collaborator, and carries his work forward in so many ways. The focus of my talk tonight is the climate crisis and the central role that systems that rank the relative value of human beings, including but not limited to white supremacy, patriarchy, and Orientalism have played in deepening that crisis. Before I get into all of that, I should acknowledge that it may seem slightly strange for an Edward Said Memorial Lecture to focus on an environmental topic. Said, as some of you are aware, was not known as a tree hugger. Descended from traders, artisans, and professionals, he once described himself as an extreme case of an urban Palestinian whose relationship to the land is basically metaphorical. In After the Last Sky, Said's powerful meditation on the photographs of Jean Moore, he explored the most intimate aspects of Palestinian lives, from hospitality to sports to home decor, the tiniest detail, the placement of a photograph, the defiant posture of a child, provoked a torrent of insight from Said. But when confronted with images of Palestinian farmers tending to their flocks, working the fields, this specificity evaporated. Which crops were being cultivated, the state of the soil, the state of the water supply, mysteriously gone. Said confessed, I continue to perceive a population of poor, suffering, occasionally colorful peasants, unchanged and collective, though he acknowledged that this perception was bas basically mythic. Um, if farming was another wor world for Edward Said, those who devoted their lives to issues like air and water pollution basically seemed to occupy another planet. Speaking to his colleague, Rob Nixon, he once described environmentalism, this is Edward Said, as, quote, the indulgence of spoiled tree huggers who lack a proper cause. <laughs> now, in preparation for this lecture, I spoke to Rob Nixon, uh, and we both agreed that this remark required some context. The environmental challenges of the Middle East are impossible to ignore for anyone immersed in that region's geopolitics, as Edward Said, of course, was. This is a region intensely vulnerable to heat and water stress, to sea level rise and desertification. A recent paper in the journal Nature Climate Change predicts that unless we radically lower our emissions and fast, by the end of this century, large parts of the Middle East will likely, and this is a quote, experience temperature levels that are intolerable to humans. Now, climate scientists aren't known for being direct. Um, this is about as blunt as they get. Yet despite this, environmental issues in the region tend to still be seen as a luxury. And the reason is not ignorance and it's not indifference. It's just bandwidth. Climate change is a grave threat, but it's most frightening in the medium term. And there are always more pressing short-term concerns to deal with, like military occupation, air assault, systemic discrimination, embargo. Nothing can or should compete with that. There are other reasons why environmentalism might have looked to Saeed like a bourgeois playground. The Israeli state has long coded its nation-building project in a green veneer. In fact, this has been a key part of the Zionist back-to-the-land pioneer ethos. And in this context, trees specifically have been among the most potent weapons of land grabbing and occupation. It's not only the countless olive and pistachio groves that have been uprooted to make way 
for settlements and Israeli-only roads, you see here a photograph of someone who is not your typical tree hugger, I think you will agree. It's also the sprawling pine and eucalyptus forests that have been planted over those orchards, as well as over Palestinian villages, most notoriously by the Jewish National Fund, known as the JNF. Under its slogan, Turning the Desert Green, the JNF boasts of having planted 250 million trees in Israel since 1901, many of them non-native to the region. In publicity materials, the JNF bills itself as just another green NGO, concerned with forest and water management, parks and recreation. It also happens to be the largest private landowner in the state of Israel, and despite a number of complicated legal challenges, it still refuses to lease or sell land to non-Jews. Now, I grew up in a Jewish community where every occasion, births and deaths, Mother's Day, bar mitzvahs, were marked with the proud purchase of JNF trees in that person's honor. It wasn't until adulthood that I began to understand that those feel-good, faraway conifers, which certificates for which uh, were papered the walls of my Montreal elementary school, were not merely benign, not just something to plant and later hug. In fact, these trees are among the most glaring symbols of Israel's system of official discrimination, the one that must be dismantled if peaceful coexistence is to become possible. The JNF is an extreme and recent example of what some call green colonialism. But the phenomenon is hardly new, nor is it unique to Israel. There's a long and painful history in the Americas of beautiful pieces of wilderness turned into conservation parks, and then and that designation being used to prevent indigenous people from accessing their ancestral territories to hunt and fish or to live, for that matter. It has happened again and again. A contemporary version of this phenomenon is the carbon offset. Indigenous people from Brazil to Uganda find that some of the most aggressive land grabbing today is being done by conservation organizations. A forest is suddenly rebranded a carbon offset that allows us to continue to pollute in countries like Britain, and it is put off limits to its traditional inhabitants. As a result, the carbon offset market has created a new class of green human rights abuses with farmers and indigenous people being physically attacked at times by park rangers and private security when they try to access their lands. So these comments about tree huggers, I think, should be seen in this context and in this history. And there's more. The last year of Edward Said's life, uh, Israel was building the so-called separation barrier. It was going up, seizing huge swaths of the West Bank, cutting Palestinian workers off from their jobs, farmers from their fields, patients from hospitals, and often brutally dividing families. There was no shortage of reasons to oppose that wall on human rights grounds. Yet at the time, some of the loudest dissenting voices among Israeli Jews were not focused on any of these issues. Rather, Israel's then environment minister, Yehudit Naot, worried about a report that informed her that, quote, the separation fence is harmful to the landscape, the flora and fauna, the ecological corridors, and the drainage of the creeks. I certainly don't want to stop or delay the building of the fence, she said, but I'm disturbed by the environmental damage involved. As Palestinian activist and author Omar Barghouti later observed, Naot's ministry and the National Parks Protection Authority mounted diligent rescue efforts to save an affected reserve of irises by moving it to an alternative reserve. They've also created tiny passages through the wall for animals. Perhaps this best puts that cynicism about the green movement in context. People do tend to get cyn cynical when their lives are treated as less important than flowers and reptiles. And yet, and yet there is so much of Saeed's intellectual legacy that both illuminates and clarifies the underlying causes of the global ecological crisis. 
so much indeed that points how we might respond in ways that are far more inclusive than so many current campaign models that do not ask suffering people to shelve their concerns about war, poverty, and systemic racism, and first save the world, but instead demonstrate how all of these crises are interconnected and how the solutions can be as well. In short, Edward Said may have had no time for tree huggers, but tree huggers must urgently make time for Edward Said and for a great many other key anti-imperialist and post-colonial thinkers. Because there is no way to understand how we ended up in this dangerous place, nor to grasp the transformations required to get us out. So what follows are some thoughts, by no means complete, about what we can learn from reading Edward Said in a warming world. He was and remains among our most achingly eloquent theorists of exile and homesickness. But Said's homesickness, he was always made clear, was for a home that had been so radically altered that it no longer really existed. His was a complex position. He fiercely defended the right of return, but never claimed that home was fixed. Was ma what mattered was the principle of respecting all human rights equally, that restorative justice must inform all of our actions and policies. This perspective is deeply relevant in our time of fast eroding coastlines, of nations disappearing beneath the rising seas, of coral reefs that sustain entire cultures bleached white, of a balmy Arctic. Because longing for a radically altered homeland, a homeland that may not even exist any longer, is a state that is being rapidly and tragically globalized. James Hansen, perhaps the most respected climate scientist in the world, formerly of NASA, published a paper recently, a very alarming paper about sea level rise, in which he warns that on our current emission trajectory, we face the quote, loss of all coastal cities, most of the world's large cities, and all of their history, and not in thousands of years, as previous models had suggested, but this century, unless we act very quickly. A world of people searching for a home that no longer exists. That is where we are headed if we don't demand radical change. And Saeed helps us imagine what that might look like as well. He helped to popularize the Arabic word sumud, sumud, I think I'm saying it wrong, to stay put, to hold on. That steadfast refusal to leave one's land despite the most desperate eviction attempts and even when surrounded by continuous danger. It's a word most associated with places like Hebron and Gaza, but it could be applied equally today to residents of coastal Louisiana, who have had to raise their homes on stilts so that they don't have to evacuate, or to Pacific Islanders whose slogan is, we're not drowning, we're fighting. In countries like the Marshall Islands and Fiji and Tuvalu, they know that so much sea level rise is already locked in that their countries probably don't have a future, but they refuse to simply concern themselves with the logistics of relocation even if there were safer countries willing to open their borders, which is a very big if, considering that climate refugees currently have no recognition under international law. But as you see here, um, instead they are actively resisting, blockading Australian coal ships with traditional outrigger canoes, disrupting international climate negotiations with their inconvenient presence, demanding far more aggressive climate action. If there is anything worth celebrating in the Paris Agreement signed last month, and unfortunately there isn't enough worth celebrating, it is because of this kind of principled climate action, what we might call climate sumud. But this only scratches the surface of what we can learn from reading Said in a warming world. He was, of course, the giant in the study of othering, what he described in Orientalism as disregarding, essentializing, denuding the humanity of another culture, people, 
or geographical region. And once the other has been firmly established, the ground is softened for any transgression, violent expulsion, land theft, occupation, invasion, because of course the whole point of othering is that the other does not have the same rights, the same humanity that the people doing the othering have. So what does this have to do with the climate crisis? Maybe everything. Because we have dangerously warmed our world already, and our governments still refuse to take the actions necessary to halt this trend. There was a time when most of us could have claimed ignorance, but for the past three decades, ever since the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, ever since our governments started meeting to negotiate emission reductions, we have lost all plausible deniability. This has been done with the full awareness of the dangers. The point is that this kind of recklessness would have been functionally impossible without institutionalized racism, however latent, without Orientalism, without all the potent tools on offer that allow the powerful to discount the lives of the less powerful. These tools are what allow for the writing off of entire nations and ancient cultures like those Pacific Islands. And there's something else too. These tools of ranking the relative value of humans are what allowed for the digging up of all of that carbon to begin with. Now, fossil fuels are not the sole driver of climate change, so is industrial agriculture, so is deforestation, but they are the largest single driver of climate change. And the thing about fossil fuels is that they're so inherently dirty and toxic that they require sacrificial people and sacrificial places. They always have. People whose lungs and bodies could be sacrificed to work in the coal mines. People whose land and water can be sacrificed to open pit mining and oil spills. As recently as the 1970s, government documents openly referred to certain parts of the United States as national sacrifice areas. Places like the mountains of Appalachia blasted off for coal mining because so-called mountaintop removal, as this practice is called, is cheaper than digging holes underground to dig up that coal. And to sacrifice an entire region, to blow up their mountains, there must be theories of othering to justify it. And how the people, about how the people who lived there were so poor and so backwards, their lives and culture didn't deserve protecting. After all, if you're a hillbilly, who cares about your hills? Turning all that coal into electricity required another layer of othering, this one for the urban populations that would live next door to the power plants and the refineries. In North America, these are overwhelmingly communities of color, black and Latino, forced to carry the toxic burden of our collective addiction to fossil fuels with markedly higher rates of respiratory illnesses like asthma and cancer clusters. It was in fights like this that the term environmental racism was born and the climate justice movement ultimately was born. These fossil fuel sacrifice zones dot the globe, like the Niger Delta, poisoned by an Exxon Valdez worth of spilled oil every single year. A process that Ken Sarawiwa, before he was murdered by his government, called ecological genocide. The executions of community leaders, he said, were all for shell. In my country, Canada, the decision to dig up the Alberta tar sands, a particularly heavy form of oil that needs to be mined, has required the shredding of treaties with First Nations, treaties signed with the British Crown that guaranteed Indigenous people the right to continue to hunt and fish and lead traditional lives on their ancestral lands. It required it because these rights are meaningless when the land is desecrated. This is uh, an image of a before and after image of the boreal forest after tar sands mining. It required it because these rights are meaningless when the land is being unmade like this, when the rivers are being polluted and the moose and the fish are riddled with tumors. And it gets worse because, as you may have heard in the news just today, Fort McMurray, the town at the dead center of the tar sands boom 
where so many of the workers who do that mining live and where much of the money um, is spent. It's currently in an infernal blaze. It's that hot and that dry. The whole place, the whole town of Fort McMurray is currently under evacuation, and that may have a little something to do with what is being mined there. Even without that kind of dramatic event, though, this kind of resource extraction is a form of violence, what Rob Nixon calls slow violence, because it does so much damage to the land and water that it means the end of a way of life, a death of cultures that are inseparable from the land. Severing indigenous people's connection to the land used to be state policy in my country, imposed through the forcible removal of indigenous children from their families, sent to boarding schools where their languages and cultural practices were banned and where physical and sexual abuse were rampant. A recent Truth and Reconciliation study report called it genocide. The trauma associated with these layers of forced separation from land, from culture, from family, is directly linked to the epidemic of despair ravaging so many First Nations communities today. And I think this too may have made the news over here. Maybe you heard about the community of Attawapiskat, a small community of 2,000 people, where on a single Saturday night last month, 11 people tried to take their own lives. Meanwhile, De Beers runs a diamond mine on the community's traditional territory. Like all extractive projects, it had promised hope and opportunity. Why don't the people just leave? This is what the politicians and the pundits ask in the face of this suicide epidemic, and many do. And that departure is linked in part to the thousands of indigenous women in Canada who have been murdered and gone missing, many in large cities. The connection between violence against women and violence against the land, often to extract resources like fossil fuels, this connection is rarely made in press reports, but it's there. Every new government comes to power promising a new era of respectful relations with indigenous people, of respecting indigenous rights, and they don't deliver. They don't deliver because indigenous rights include the right to refuse extractive projects. That is what is in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, the, 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 the right to informed consent, the right to refuse even when those projects fuel national economic growth. And that's a problem because growth is our culture, it's our religion, it's our way of life. So even Canada's hunky and charming new prime minister is bound and determined to build new tar sands pipelines, to build them against the express wishes of indigenous communities who have said, no, we will not risk our water, we will not participate in the further destabilizing of the climate. Fossil fuels require sacrifice zones. They always have, and they still do. And you don't have a system built on sacrificial places and sacrificial people unless intellectual theories exist that justify their sacrifice. And those theories still persist from Manifest Destiny to Terra Nullius to Orientalism, from backwards hillbillies to backwards Indians. The theories of othering survive despite all the lip service paid to political correctness because they are so very useful because they are so very profitable, because they are inextricable from capitalism, inextricable from extractivism, and now inextricable from climate change. And this brings us to another crucial point. You know, we often hear climate change blamed on human nature, on the inherent greed and short-sightedness of our species. Or we'll t we're told that we have altered the Earth so much uh, and on such a planetary scale that we are now living in the Anthropocene, the age of humans. These ways of explaining our current circumstances are saying something very specific, if unspoken. They're saying that humans are one thing, that human nature can be essentialized to the traits that created this culture, and in so doing, the systems that certain humans created and other humans powerfully resisted and resist still are let completely off the hook. Systems like 
capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, those sorts of systems. And there's something else these diagnoses tend to do. They erase the very real existence of other human systems that organize life very differently. Systems that insist that humans must think seven generations in the future, that we must not only be good citizens but good ancestors, must take no more than we need and give back to protect the lands and the systems of regeneration. Those systems existed and exist still and they are erased every time we say that the climate crisis is one of human nature and that we are living in something called the age of man. And they are systems that come under very real attack when mega projects are being built, not just in the past, but today, taking the lives of land defenders like Berta Caceres, assassinated in Honduras just two months ago, leading indigenous resistance against a hydro project. Now some say it doesn't have to be this bad. We can clean up resource extraction. It doesn't have to look like it does in Honduras or the Niger Delta or even the Alberta tar sands, except for the fact that we are running out of easy and cheap ways to get at fossil fuels. And that's why we've seen the rise of technologies like fracking and the mining of this heavy fuel in northern Alberta called tar sands in the first place. And this, in turn, is starting to challenge that original Faustian uh, bargain at the center of the industrial age, this idea that the heaviest risks would be outsourced, offloaded, onto the other, the periphery within our own countries and in other countries. That's becoming less and less possible. Fracking is threatening some of the most picturesque parts of Britain, which has caused an uprising in this country. The sacrifice zone is expanding, swallowing up all kinds of places that imagine themselves safe. So this is not just about gasping at how ugly the Alberta tar sands are. It's about acknowledging that there is no clean, safe, non-toxic way to run an economy powered by fossil fuels, and there never was. There's also an avalanche of evidence showing that there is no peaceful way to do it either. The trouble is structural. Fossil fuels, unlike renewable forms of energy like wind and solar, are not widely distributed. They are highly concentrated in very specific locations. And well, those locations have a bad habit of being under other people's countries and other people's sands, particularly that most potent and precious of fossil fuels, oil which is why the project of Orientalism, of othering Arab and Muslim people, has been the silent partner of our oil dependence from the start, and, inextricable, and inextricably, therefore, part of the blowback that is climate change. Because if nations and people are regarded as other, exotic, primitive, bloodthirsty, as Edward Said documented back in the 1970s, it is far easier to wage wars and stage coups when they get this crazy idea that they should control their own oil for their own interests. Again and again and again, in 1953, it was the British and US collaboration to overthrow the democratically elected government of Mohammed Mossadegh after he nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, now BP. In 2003, exactly 50 years later, it was another US-UK co-production, the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq. The reverberations of each intervention continue to jolt our world, as do the reverberations from the successful burning of all that oil, and nowhere more so than in the Middle East itself, a region that is now squeezed in the pincer of violence caused by fossil fuels on the one hand, the quest for fossil fuels on the one hand, and the impacts of burning those fossil fuels on the other. <clears throat> The Israeli architect, Eyal Weissman, has a groundbreaking take on how these forces are intersecting in his latest book, The Conflict Shoreline. He explains that the main way, he explains that the main way we've understood the border in, uh, of the desert in the Middle East and North Africa is the so-called aridity line. These are lines indicating an average 200 millimeters of rainfall per year. 
That's been considered the minimum for growing cereal crops on a large scale without irrigation. So we're looking here at two key aridity lines uh, in this graphic, and, and, and White's been generously shared this with me, and he was hoping to be here tonight, but he wasn't able to be. Uh, so these meteorological boundaries are not fixed. There are, there's always fluctuations within them, whether it's Israel's attempts to green the desert, which pushes the aridity line in one direction, or cyclical drought in this region that pushes it in the other. And now, with climate change, intensifying drought is having all kinds of impacts along, along these lines. Weitzman points out that the Syrian border city of, Dur of Dura, which I think you see there, falls directly on the aridity line. That's where Syria's deepest drought on record brought huge numbers of displaced farmers in the years leading up to the outbreak of Syria's civil war. It's also where the Syrian uprising broke out in 2011. <clears throat> Drought was not the only factor bringing tensions to a head, as we all know, but the fact that 1.5 million people were internally displaced in Syria clearly exacerbated the tensions. This is something that is not controversial to say John Kerry has said it on numerous occasions. This connection between water stress and conflict is a recurring pattern along the aridity line. If you look at some of the names we've put on the map, you will see some familiar ones from Libya to Gaza, some of the bloodiest battlefields in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now check this out. Weizmann discovered what he calls an astounding coincidence. When you map the targets of Western drone strikes onto this region, if you can just do that, you see, and here I'm quoting him, that many of these attacks from South Waziristan through Northern Yemen, Somalia, Mali, Iraq, Gaza, and Libya are directly on or close to the 200 millimeter aridity line. So those red dots represent some of the areas where drone strikes have been most concentrated. I was really struck when I saw this image, and this is why I wanted to share it with you, because I think it's the most striking attempt yet to visualize the brutal landscape of the climate crisis. Speaking of aridity. So some of this was foreshadowed a decade ago in a US military report published by the Center for Naval Analyses. And many people have pointed out though, that although there is a high degree of climate change denial in the United States, particularly among Republicans, um, the US military has been talking openly about this for a long time. So this is a 2007 report. And it makes the, the following rather stark observation. The Middle East has always been associated with two natural resources, oil because of its abundance and water because of its scarcity. Uh, so I thought that was a, an apt quote. It's true enough. And now certain patterns are quite clear. First, Western fighter jets followed that abundance of oil. Now Western drones are closely shadowing the lack of water as drought exacerbates conflict in the region. And the story doesn't end there, because just as bombs follow oil and drones follow drought, so do boats follow both. Boats filled with refugees, fleeing homes ravaged by war and drought all along the aridity line. And that same capacity for dehumanizing the other, the one that justifies the bombs and the drones, is now being trained, as you know, on these migrants casting their need for security as a threat to ours, their desperate flight as some sort of invading army. So of course we are now seeing a migration of a more brutal sort, tactics honed on the West Bank and in other occupation zones, making their way to North America and Europe. In selling his wall on the border with Mexico, Donald Trump likes to say, ask Israel, the wall works. Camps are bulldozed in Calais. Thousands of people drown in the Mediterranean. The Australian government detains survivors of war and despotic regimes in camps on remote islands like Nauru and Manus. Conditions are so desperate on Nauru that last week, an Iranian migrant died after setting himself on fire to draw, try to draw the world's attention. Just two days ago on Monday, 
Another migrant, a 21-year-old woman from Somalia, set herself on fire on Nauru. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull warns that Australians cannot be misty-eyed about this and have to be very clear and determined in our national purpose. It's something to keep in mind the next time a columnist in a, at a Murdoch paper declares, as one Katie Hopkins did last year, that it's time for Britain to get Australian, quote, bring on the gunships, force migrants back to their shores, and burn the boats, unquote. Nauru, incidentally, is one of the Pacific islands very vulnerable to sea level rise. Its residents, after seeing their home turned into a prison for others, will very possibly have to migrate themselves. So how is that for symbolism? Tomorrow's climate refugees recruited into service as today's prison guards. What is happening on that island and what is happening to that island are, I believe, expressions of the same logic. Why? Because a culture that places so little value on black and brown lives that it is willing to let human beings disappear beneath the waves or set themselves on fire in detention camps is also going to be willing to let countries where black and brown people live disappear beneath the waves or desiccate in the arid heat. And when that happens, theories of human hierarchy and taking care of our own first will be marshaled to rationalize these monstrous decisions. In truth, we are already doing it, if only implicitly. We do it because though climate change will ultimately be an existential threat to all of humanity in the short term, we know that it does discriminate, that it does hit the poor first and worst, whether they're abandoned on rooftops in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, or right now in Southern and East Africa where 36 million people face hunger due to drought, according to the UN, 36 million. This is an emergency, not a future emergency, a present emergency, a five alarm fire. But in this country and mine, we aren't acting like it. The Paris Agreement, the much celebrated Paris Agreement, commits to keeping warming below two degrees Celsius. That is double the warming that is already causing these types of impacts, double of what we've already done. It's beyond reckless. When that target of two degrees warming was first unveiled in 2009 in Copenhagen, the African delegates walked out of the sessions en masse and said that it was a death sentence for their continent, that they couldn't survive it. The island nations said we needed to keep warming below 1.5 for them to survive. Their slogan has become 1.5 to stay alive. At the last minute, a clause was added to the Paris Agreement that says countries will, quote, pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Pursue efforts. This is not exactly binding stuff. And we are making no such efforts. The same governments that made these promises went home, pushed fracking like your government, pushed tar sands pipelines like my government, development projects that are completely incompatible with meeting a two degree temperature target, let alone a 1.5 target. And this is happening for a cruel and crass reason, because the wealthiest people in the wealthiest countries in the world think they're going to be okay, think someone else is going to have to eat the risk think that even when climate change comes to our doorsteps, they're going to be taken care of. And when it does come, that's when things start to get really ugly. We had a glimpse of this when the floodwaters rose in England last December and January, inundating 16,000 homes. Now, these communities weren't only dealing with Britain's wettest December on record. They were also coping with the fact that your austerity-crazed government has waged a relentless attack on the public sphere, including the agencies and the councils on the front lines of flood defense. So understandably, there were many who wanted to change the subject from that abject failure, away from the manufactured crisis of austerity, away from the money lost to overseas tax havens. And where did they change the subject to? Of course, they changed them to 
the usual other. This could have been a moment to understand human connection and interdependence, that we are all impacted by climate change, that wealth and skin color offers little protection, that we must take action in solidarity with one another. Instead, that hierarchy of humanity that has been the partner to warming from the start reared its head yet again. Why, they asked, is Britain spending so much money on refugees and foreign aid when it should be taking care of its own. Never mind foreign aid, we heard in the, in the Daily Mail, what about national aid? Why, demanded a Telegraph editorial, should British taxpayers continue to pay for flood defenses abroad when the money is needed at home? Maybe because you guys invented the steam engine, but that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other question, okay. Um, this is what we must always remember. Climate change is not just about things getting hotter and wetter, though it's about that too. It's also about things getting meaner and uglier unless we change these corrosive values at the center of this economic and political system that pits us against one another. What can we learn from all of this? I think the most important lesson is that there is absolutely no way to confront the climate crisis as a technocratic problem in isolation from everything else as we've been trying to do for so long. It must be seen in the context of austerity and privatization, of colonialism and militarism, and of the various systems of othering needed to sustain all of it. The connections and intersections are clear, glaring, and yet so often, the resistance is highly compartmentalized and siloed still. The anti-austerity people rarely talk about climate change. The climate change people rarely talk about war and occupation. Seldom do we make the connections between the guns that take black lives on the streets of the United States and in police custody and the much larger forces that annihilate so many black lives on arid land and in precarious boats around the world. Overcoming these disconnections, finding and strengthening the threads of connection between all of our various issues and movements is, I would argue, the most pressing task of anyone preoccupied with social and economic justice. It is the only way to build counter power sufficiently robust and motivated to win against the forces protecting this highly profitable but increasingly discredited and untenable status quo. I've been describing the ways that climate change acts as an accelerant to many of our social ills inequality, wars, racism, but by the same token, and this is what I argue and this changes everything, it can also be an accelerant for the opposite, for the forces working for social and economic justice and against militarism. Indeed, the climate crisis, by presenting our species with an existential crisis and putting us on a firm and unyielding science-based deadline might just be the catalyst we need to knit together a great many powerful movements, bound together by a belief in the inherent worth and value of all people, united by a rejection of the sacrifice zone mentality, whether it is applied to people or to places by the understanding that we face so many overlapping and intersecting crises that we cannot fix them sequentially. We need integrated solutions. We need to design and fight for policies that radically bring down emissions, create huge numbers of well-paying jobs that pay a living wage, that are, are unionized, and that bring justice to the sacrifice zones, to the front lines of climate impacts, First of all, we need to do this between countries and within our countries. In Canada, I've been part of a project that we call the LEAP Manifesto, which articulates what these policies must be. And one of, the, one of our demands is that we want energy democracy as we switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy. We don't want to just be buying renewable energy from Shell and Exxon. We want communities to own and control their own renewable energy projects, and we want indigenous communities and other frontline communities who have gotten the worst deal in the current extractive economy to be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects. That's energy justice, that is energy reparations. 
Those who knew Saeed well observed that at the end of his life, he was increasingly concerned about ecological issues. He died the year Iraq was invaded, living to see its libraries and museums looted while its oil ministry was faithfully guarded. Amidst these outrages, he found hope in the global anti-war movement, as well as from new forms of grassroots communication opened up by technology. <clears throat> he described it like this, the existence of alternative communities across the globe, informed by alternative news sources and keenly aware of the environmental, human rights, and libertarian impulses that bind us together on this tiny planet. You will note that his vision even had a place for tree huggers. I was reminded of these words recently when I was reading up on England's recent floods. And amidst all the scapegoating and finger pointing in the corporate press, I came across a post by a man named Liam Cox. He was upset by the way some in the media were using the disaster to, royal, to, royal up anti, sorry, to rile up anti-foreigner sentiment. He used words somewhat coarser than one might expect at a lecture in honor of the impeccably erudite Edward Said, but I think they belong here nonetheless. Here is what Mr. Cox wrote. I live in Hemded Bridge, Yorkshire, one of the worst affected areas hit by the floods. It's shit. Everything has gotten really wet. However, I'm alive. I'm safe. My family are safe. We don't live in fear. I'm free. There aren't bullets flying around. There aren't bombs going off. I'm not being forced to flee my home, and I'm not being shunned by the richest countries in the world or criticized by its residents. <clears throat> All of you morons vomiting your xenophobia about how much money should be, about how money should only be spent on our own need to look at yourselves closely in the mirror. I request you ask yourselves a very important question. Am I a decent and honorable human being? <laughs> because home isn't just the UK. Home is everywhere on this planet. I think that makes for a fine last word. Thank you. We're now going to, um, to move to a, a period of, uh, of discussion. And I'll just abuse the chair with, with one question, if I may, to, to begin with, because when I was reading your book, you appreciate that in my life as an activist, I have sometimes sort of descended into the grin. It kind of can be a bit of an occupational hazard. No, never, Shami. You're the funniest <laughs> woman alive. Um, um, How do you keep optimistic? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I mean, I wouldn't describe my general state as sort of sunny optimism. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a, a wonderful scholar in the United States named John Powell. He teaches at um, Berkeley, and, um, he, and he has a great frame around othering, he, othering and belonging. Uh, and, and what John says is, I'm not an optimist, I'm a possibilist, right? Um, and, you know, so, so, he's, so, so the idea is that, you know, if you were placing a bet um, on whether humans were going to get their act together on the kind of tight deadline that we're on when it comes to climate change, you know, I would bet with, you know, I'd bet with Exxon, not with us, right? But so long as there's still any possibility that we could avoid this dystopic future, that we catch glimpses of in these moments, right, where you know the flood becomes a moment to scapegoat refugees, or you know in Katrina, where after abandoning the people on their rooftops, then they get called looters when they look for food and water. I mean, so we 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 catch these moments, and that's 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 the road we're on, right? So I'm motivated by that fear, um, which you know the people who know the shock doctrine know that I've spent a lot of time in those sort of scary places. Um, but, you know, I've, I've read the science, you know, and, and there is still time. It would be very hard, but what is exciting, and this is why I'm not, you know, I don't feel, spend my time feeling so grim, is that I really do genuinely believe that if we took the climate crisis as seriously as it deserves to be treated, if we built these types of coalitions, it, we wouldn't just prevent 
future apocalypse, we have a chance to build a much better present than we have right now. And that's very motivating for me. But I mean, I'm motivated by the fear and the hope in equal parts, to be honest with you. Now, what scares the hell out of me is Katrina. Like, I feel like 10 years ago, we got this glimpse into where this road leads, right? You had money, you could get out of the city, check into a hotel, call your insurance company. But if you needed there to be a functioning state, you were abandoned and it broke down on racial lines in a completely brutal way. And then the people who were the victims of that were animalized in the corporate press. So that's the road I want to get off. And I think there, I, you know, I, I, the, other, the other thing that I, I feel hopeful about is, you know, people su surprise us, right? I mean, I, I, I know Bernie Sanders. I like Bernie Sanders. I would never have predicted that Bernie Sanders would have gone as far as he has gone in the U.S. election, you know? <laughs> So, so, you know, we have these moments where we see the appetite for transformation, for deep change. And I believe that, that what our stumbling block is, frankly, is a lack of vision and confidence on the left, right? And this comes from sort of studying what the right does in these moments of crisis, right? The scary thing about New Orleans during Katrina wasn't just what happened during the disaster, it was what happened after. They privatized the school system, they shut down the public hospital, they demolished public housing and put up condos. The right was ready with their plan. So my thing is, you need a plan. So, the, so green, is the, <laughs> green is the new red. <laughs> um, I think they look good together. I don't know. <laughs> so it's Christmas, right? right. <laughs> so now let's let's hear from some of these lovely people in this enormous in this enormous audience. Can we start in the balcony, please? And I know that there are some lovely people from the South Bank Centre who can get, can can pick <clears throat> one of your number and take you to the to the standing microphone and you may put a question or um, perhaps a, a succinct comment or my favorite by the way which are those comments that are very thinly disguised as questions Do you, you, you know about those now yeah. <laughs> and you know and the way to do that but I've heard of them is to just kind of raise your voice at the end of the <laughs> sentence as if you're French or Australian or something like that right because it's an internationalist audience or you can just say don't you think so, so, so who's ready to, um, do I have someone? Thank you. So we're coming up for an EU referendum. Oh, jeez. I was afraid oh, you really? would ask me about this. Yeah. Don't you think? Don't you think? <laughs> um, where do you see us going? What do you think is the most positive road that could come out of that? Oh, man. Um, it was funny. I was asking some of my... Um, London friends last night. Are they going to ask me about Brexit? Do I have to have a position? They're like, no, they won't ask you. But um, it's dangerous for you, <laughs> Naomi, because you're North American and people might accuse you of commenting on the basis of your heritage. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to be honest with you. I haven't been following it that closely. Okay. <laughs> I understand a lot of people here aren't following it all that closely. It's either. only one continent. It's not the whole world. It's fine. Um, who, who's next? Maybe someone from the, the, the rear stalls. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Naomi. Can hi. I get your thoughts on uh, the first action in the Break Free campaign uh, yesterday, which took place yesterday in South Wales, where Reclaim the Power shut down the UK's largest open cast coal mine? Right on, you know, I think that um, I think for those of, uh, some of you know what Break Free is, some of you don't. Um, you know, there is this global movement of people taking on the fossil, fossil fuel um, giants and these big infrastructure projects that are about digging up unburnable carbon, right? We know that fossil fuel companies have five times more carbon in their proven reserves than is compatible with the two degree temperature target our government's committed to 
in Paris, let alone the 1.5 aspirational target, and yet they're still digging it up, they still want to build new mines, new, new pipelines. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these fights are very local, um, and the idea for break free is that in, in the month of May, um, everybody's drawing their red lines um, and saying this is, this is carbon that has to stay in the ground. And so this was an amazing action in Wales. Um, there was a huge action in the Philippines. If you check my Twitter feed, I retweeted this amazing um, action. And it's very global. It is not you know, just the global north that is taking on these, the, the, these huge carbon deposits. Uh, there's actions in Indonesia. Um, and uh, and the, we've got a lot happening in, in the tar sands, taking on pipelines. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I think it's going to be an exciting month. And stay tuned. Follow hashtag break free. Right, let's move nearer the front now. Y yes, madam. Do we have a microphone? Did someone got their running shoes on. Ethically sourced, you understand. <coughs> this lady here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for a wonderful talk. Um, my, my question is really about um, the sort of vision of the left and... Whether technology, because that's something you didn't really speak about too much, but, but what, what your view is on technology for sort of a forward vision, perhaps, um, and maybe that, how that relates to addiction. I know you said we are addicted to fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, this is becoming a big question, but, uh, but maybe we're also addicted to technology, and that's why the fossil fuel addiction happens as well. I don't know. Um, I'll leave it at the technology bit, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. Um, I mean, tech... You know, technology is broad, right? And, and certainly technology is going to play a role in our response. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the sort of roadmap we lay out in the leap, for instance, is a, a huge tech, technological shift in how we generate energy, moving towards renewables, 100% renewables, as quickly as we possibly can do it. Um, we've got great research out of Stanford University that says that the whole world could get to 100% renewables in the next three decades. So if the scientists are saying we have to do it, the engineers are saying we can do it with existing technologies without the sort of um, energy miracle that Bill Gates talks about, which is of next generation nuclear. This, so I think that what we're addicted to is less the technology, but more this idea that, you know, Arundhati Roy talks about how everyone wants to change without changing, right? And I think the promise of some, you know, perfect nuclear technology with no risks, right, is that nothing changes. Um, whereas we're, the kind of the kind of changes I'm talking about, really it changes our economic system, it changes how much energy uh, we consume, because it is not just about flipping the switch from fossil fuels to renewable, it's also about dealing with the demand side. Um, and also, you know, we're talking about changing how we move ourselves around, huge investments in public transit um, and rail. So technology plays a part, but I think the, where we are addicted is this idea that there's some magic, that we are so smart. And this, is, and this comes back to, I had a long section of the speech that I cut because it was getting really obscure about the Anthropocene. Um, and you know, these heroic narratives, right? I mean, one of the things that worries me about the Anthropocene um, paradigm, right, this idea that the age of man is, is, is sort of um, this idea that, you know, we broke it, we bought it, right? Like, we're, th th there's a way in which it flatters us. Like, we, we, you know, we are gods now. I mean, Mark Linus wrote a book called The God Species, right? So it's this idea that because we screwed things up so badly, we will, you know, we're, we're, this is somehow triumphant, and we will figure it out with nuclear technology, with geoengineering, with GMOs, um, and technology will fix it all. And as somebody who's, um, you know, as a journalist covered some of the biggest indust industrial accidents, you know, in recent uh, memory, like the Deepwater Horizon disaster, I was just in a, you know, a, a place in California where the disaster is invisible because it's a huge methane leak in a place called Canyon Ranch, Los Angeles, but it's as, it, it's as significant from a climate perspective as the Deepwater Horizon, the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. So I feel pretty in touch with the fact that humans are fallible, that we screw things up, and the smartest guys in the room often screw things up, right, if you think about the derivatives and so on. So I'm not super excited about putting the whole planet, you know, in their hands with dimming the sun and the rest of it. Um, it, it what worries me is screwing up. I think that's a really valid fear. Um, 
Uh, Wendell Berry talks about that, that there's an appropriate scale to risk, right? It's not that we can't take risks, but um, knowing that failure is possible, uh, we don't have the right to gamble with the entire planet. So that, that worries me on the technology front. Um, and the other part around geoengineering specifically, because this is where the techno fantasies really take over, right? Geoengineering is the idea that we can spray sulfur into the stratosphere and dim the sun, and that way we'll forcibly cool the planet. This is based, this is sometimes called the Pinatubo option, the idea that we are mimicking a volcano. And I know this sounds sci-fi, but this is actually taken more seriously than putting up solar panels in the United States. Um, <laughs> like we can put, we can dim the sun, but no, we can't put up solar panels. Um, so, but um, what worries me is that when there have been these super volcanoes, it does bring the temperature down, but it d also interferes with the Asian monsoon and the African monsoon. So what worries me most about it is what my speech was about tonight. It's how th these technologies would d be deployed in a world of othering, in a world of racism, where I could, I could see it. I could see us getting to a panicked enough state uh, around climate change that we're like, sure, let's just do it. Let's just sim dim the sun and see what happens. And what we actually know from the modeling and from history, from the history of supervolcanoes, is that we're gambling with the water supply of billions of people. And what worries me most is that it's not us, that we will, we will convince ourselves we're the ones that are not at risk, even though that's probably not true. So, so Naomi, you, you've, you've spoken very eloquently about othering, mm -hmm. and you've talked about climate justice and in, in, in terms of different peoples around the globe. What about the generational justice? Because you mm -hmm. speak very personally in your book about being personally moved or shaken from, not complacency, but from putting th this issue aside because of, your, because of your son. I think that's right. Do you want to just develop a little bit this kind of generational justice aspect? I mean, it, it's definitely a powerful, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful component of this. And there's, uh, there's a court case right now in the United States that's um, just gotten through a big hurdle, which is 19 young people who are suing the government of the United States uh, for a failure to protect their future. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing case. Um, and I think that the fossil fuel divestment movement, the power of that movement that's been so strong um, in, in the UK in recent years, it, its power comes from the fact that it's led by young people, right? It's not only young people, it's, it's, there's also you know, faculty involved and there's also happening at the city level and you know, in churches, but it's, it's, it's overwhelmingly students saying to the schools that, that, that are training them from the future, that have been entrusted to prepare them from the future, you are betraying our future. And the moral authority and the moral force that comes from that, um, I think it, it is a really, really key part of this. Yeah. Right now, can I just get advice from colleagues? Do we have the means to get mics to the wings, so to speak? Do we have a, yeah. So, so yes, madam, you had your, yeah. Thank you. Hi, Naomi. I just wanted you to speak as a journalist on this othering you were talking about in particular, because I am a journalist as well, and I'm concerned about this issue. Uh, about the attacks on freedom of expression, particularly in the press, but not only, and this fear-mongering, and in fact, freedom of restriction of movement. Uh, we saw it in Paris last November after the terrorist attacks that people couldn't come out and protest. Um, and the vilification, in particular, of all of those who present these alternative systems. You mentioned Bernie Sanders, we can mention Jeremy Corbyn in this country, and a few others also colliding with the end of independent media as a whole, or the collapse of independent media as a whole. Don't you think? Yeah, I do think. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think all of what you're saying is true. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like people are becoming more shock resilient in that, you know, I was in Paris a week after the attacks and was there for three weeks because this is when the climate summit happened, right? So many of us were there. And it was, it was really striking to be in the city and watch how quickly it went from 
we can't say anything, we're just going to follow these rules that say that we can't protest and that you know, groups of more than three people um, are an illegal demonstration, to by the time the summit was over, thousands of people were, were in the streets uh, unfurling red lines saying that the, the deal crosses all of these red lines, um, forcing the Hollande government to lift the ban on protests. So it happened really quickly. I mean, if you think back to September 11th, how long it took for people to kind of get their confidence back, it kind of took three weeks in France. I'm not saying it's all over, but I do feel like we, you know, we are living in a time of serial shocks, right? We've deregulated the market, so we've got a lot of market shocks. Um, we, are, have, we have reverberations uh, and blowback from our oil wars, and now we have climate shocks on top of it. And you know, for better and worse, we're kind of getting better at finding our feet and remembering the stakes. Um, this country, you know, watching what is going on in this country in this moment, I have to say, is, um, you know, you mentioned Sanders, and what's been striking is that despite, you know, just this unbelievable discrimination in the media, just, you know, ignoring his campaign to the extent that people are having to protest outside CNN going like, hi, I exist, just won eight states, kind of news, you know, um, that, that, that people are still finding, um, f you know, f finding each other, finding the news. You know, Sanders just won, uh, you know, Indiana with almost no coverage. People, he'd been written off, right? But people are voting differently. So, um, but the, I think there's something unique about the shaming power of the British media um, and that silencing power and just watching that full force of that censorship, which is not just media, it's, it's, it's the whole political culture, bear down on Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party in this moment. It's absolutely chilling. Um, and, you know, it, it, I, mean, I say it's unique. You know, we, we have these, these structures of shaming and disciplining societies, um, you know, in other countries, but I think you guys sort of invented it. Um, <laughs> And you're really good at it, right? You're really, really good at it. I'm excited to leave. No, sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Where's <laughs> um, no, that me? No, don't clap for me being excited to leave. No, it's hard. You've got to resist it. You've got to name it. You know that, and 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 that you know that ability to name the fear mongering as it is happening. Um, be aware of it in yourselves, right? In each of us, we have that ability. Like, am I going to say it or not? Am I going to be quiet or not? I don't want to be the next target, right? Um, we have to be aware of it when it's happening, and we have to fight against it individually and collectively. There's a gentleman. Uh you may applaud. There's a gentleman over there. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks very much. That was brilliant. Um, you said we need a plan. Um, and in This Changes Everything, there's an amazing chapter uh, where you talk about the 2008 crash as being a perfect moment um, to reorganize the global energy nexus. And, and you give brilliant examples from the US. Um, it's visionary and it's amazing, but how does the left or how do we generally as a species maybe engage those plans? Uh, the left, actually. How does the left en engage those Forget plans? Forget the rest of the species. Yeah, fuck the rest of it. <laughs> because that seems to be a failing often yeah, the plan. from the left. Mm -hmm. So could you answer? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned that you know, in, in, in Canada, we've been involved in, uh, in, in trying to do that kind of mapping. Uh, we, uh, yeah, I've been part of this coalition that brought together, uh, it, it, we've, we have now this document that's been endorsed by 200 organizations, tens of thousands of, of, of people, um, and uh, it, we did it because we felt we were in another one of these moments, right, that the 2008 financial crisis was this moment where the failures of that system revealed themselves, of this deregulated financial system, and there was this, an appetite for change and an ability to talk about radical solutions, and then the opportunity was kind of lost yeah. in the Obama moment, where it was sort of like, well, maybe he'll fix it. Well, actually, he's not going to fix it, but we sort of demobilized. So um, the reason why we organized in this moment uh, 
in Canada, and now this is being picked up in Australia, and there's a, a process similar in the, in the UK called the People's Demands, which is you know, tr doing that kind of cross-sectoral organizing, um, was because the price of oil collapsed, right? So it, this is a shock, especially if, you've, uh, if, if a big part of your economy is, has been uh, gambling on fossil fuels, and that's what we did in Canada. We gambled on the Alberta tar sands, and the price of oil went from $100 a barrel to $30. And now investors are pulling out of the tar sands, not just because of activism, but also just because it is a lot less profitable to, to dig up that oil. And I think some of this is happening with fracking as well. Um, so these are, are moments when you can really build, and I think the critical alliances with labor um, and uh, well, the, the critical alliances between the climate movement, labor, um, and communities of color that you know, are on the front lines of the dirtiest sectors, bearing that toxic load, um, making the connections with war, making the connections with migration. So please read the document. It is, um, uh, it's, you know, it is about Canada, but it's, there's, there's, I think, lots that people can take from it. Um, and we've, you know, like I said, it's been being picked up by Norwegian Greens and, um, and as far away as, uh, I don't know, Serbia. It's like people are just taking this thing. So, I mean, I'm not saying we figured it out, but as a writer, I know that it's sometimes easier <clears throat> not to be staring at a blank piece of paper. Um, so, you know, we did, you know, we, we have a sort of a first draft that might jog some of this and, and, and help uh, help people get that conversation started. But the critical part is getting in rooms with people who you don't usually get in rooms with, right? Our, our coalition, our slogan was, if you're, not, if you're not arguing, your coalition isn't big enough, right? And it's, it's very well, hard to bring Greenpeace and the, the union that represents tar sands workers together. But we did do that, sort of. But, but here's, but, <laughs> but here's the, here's the follow-up. This is a left coalition that you're describing. Is, th is there a dilemma in that? Because you're seeking, ra you're, you're, you're seeing climate change as a terrible threat, but also an opportunity yeah. for an even greater ambition. Does that mean that you are scaring the right and making those a vested interest even more entrenched? Um, well, I hope we're scaring them. Um, and I think we are, you know, I think I, I, locally, this is not just a left right. And, you know, it doesn't break down along those lines. I mean, one of the most interesting things about when you, these struggles that in the book I call blockadia, um, you know, when people are fighting the, the, you know, the fracking or fighting a new tar sands pipeline, it, 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 it's not just lefties that are doing it. It's everybody who's concerned about water and air and it bring, brings communities to, together. But the fact is that once you get to sort of national electoral political parties, the power of the fossil fuel lobby is so intense that it really is about overcoming that lobby. And I, you know, I, I believe that the biggest problem that the climate movement has faced is that we are up against the wealthiest and powerful interests in the world. We are up against um, companies that have made more money than any company in the history of money, as my friend Bill McKibben says, right? I mean, Exxon made $42 billion in a single year in profits, right? And the banks that fund them. So they fight like hell. I mean, when we say they have five times more carbon in their proven reserves than is compatible with two degrees, that means if we win, if we win a safe planet, they lose trillions of dollars, okay? So I think it doesn't serve anyone to pretend that there aren't sides in this, right? There are sides, and there are interests that are fighting like hell. It's not because they're evil, it's because they're in a system that is built to protect that model. Um, so I think we need to build coalitions that are strong enough that, that, that we have a chance of winning up against those forces. And I think the biggest problem with the environmental movement is precisely what Edward Said said. It's that it's too bourgeois. It's, you know, it, is, it's, it, is, it, it, it has been for too long the playground of the privileged. And it, this is not to say there's no room for people like me in the environmental movement, but I don't think it should be led by people like me. I think it needs to be led by the people who have the most to gain from climate action. 
You know, because we are up against the people who have a whole lot to lose, right? And so it should be, it should be led like the People's Climate March in New York City was led by indigenous people, was led by frontline communities, like the South Bronx where, you know, kids have astronomically high asthma rates, where there's a desperate need for jobs and services. I mean, places like Flint, Michigan, where, you know, environmental racism is such a profound reality. And that's just, you hear I'm just talking in a North American context, but... Um, you know, I think that it has to be a movement that, that, that really has that much to gain. And, and I think if Sanders does not win, right, which I think he probably won't, okay, uh, it will be because of the inability of the Sanders campaign to, to not to bridge a left-right divide, but to build a genuinely diverse movement, to reach the African-American community, to reach the Latino community, to knit together a coalition that represents these concerns about corporate power that it represents so well, right? That represents the climate movement, which it represents so well, but also represents this, the huge Black Lives Matter movement that also represents the immigrant rights movement that is also extremely mobilized. And that inability to knit together that, that coalition, if he fails, that will be why he failed. So, we need to figure out how to do better. Then, and, and, and then I think we could win some stuff. So does that, <laughs> we could win some stuff, <laughs> right? Maybe even a lot of stuff. So I was gonna, I was gonna go to, the, we got time for a couple more questions, I think. So I was gonna go to the front stalls, but you're too privileged, so I'm gonna go to the back stalls. <laughs> Dora, I'll come back to you in a minute. I'm gonna go to the, to the rear stalls again, please and rely on a colleague to, um, to be the hand of God, because I'm too short-sighted. So is somebody being guided to a microphone, please? Fabulous, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you. First of all, uh, first of all thank you most kindly for your presence, uh, Miss Naomi. Oh, I see. Your, your speech was indeed... Um, deeply appreciated, and your vibration is almost of eternal consequence. Uh, well, well, there you go. Um, and now the question, having, sir. Having said that, I, um, I, um, I think that you brilliantly outlined the um, symptoms of these painful problems in our wonderful planet and our wonderful world, indeed a phenomenal, phenomenally intelligent universe. But I've detected that you've been, I dare to say, that you've been somehow short on solution. And I would like to start um, briefly with asking you and contextualize first my question. No, no, don't with, contextualize it. Just ask it, sir, please. <laughs> with, regard to, with regard to Israel, I deeply care about Israel, but I do not deeply care about Israel apart from Palestinians. I also deeply care about Palestinian problem because kind of Israel and the Judeo-Christian and even Vedic tradition going further uh, sets the standard if anything, subconsciously Just or even unconsciously. Just a quick question now, sir. So please. the question is about yeah. compassion, profound yeah. compassion, non-dual compassion, um, transformative compassion. Uh, to what extent that compassion on the level of individuality as well as on the level of collectivity is a nice idea versus a profound deep, absolutely necessary, okay. meditative, heartful, mindful, okay. All right. global imperative. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Compassion. Thank you. <laughs> or would you sell self-interest and over compassion or... or, or? Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think that it... That I, I 
think compassion is, is absolutely key and it's in short supply in, in many of these debates, particularly you know, in this moment. And you know, one of the reasons why I did want to talk in my speech about Palestinian human rights in a speech in memory of Edward Said is because I feel like that's been really absent um, from a, a lot of the discussions around Zionism and anti-Semitism going on right now in this country. Um, I, 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 it is not because I don't believe anti-Semitism is a problem. I do. I do believe it's a problem. I do believe it's a problem. I've experienced it myself in this country. Um, I don't believe it's a problem specifically of the British left. I would think it's also a problem of the British right, you know? Um, what pains me is to see an important issue instrumentalized in the way that it is being instrumentalized in this election campaign. Um, and, um, you, I agree that the speech was a little short on solutions because of the nature that this was more of a of a di of a diagnosis. But you know, I do I really do uh, the the connections between, for instance, austerity and these lousy free trade deals and what we need to do in the face of the climate crisis and the tax havens that we know about from the Panama Papers. I mean, what we need to do is not just make lists of all the things we're against and all the things we want, but we need to tell alternative stories about how all of these issues are interconnected, right? Because I think we are in a moment of a failure of narrative um, where the old stories are, are totally breaking down, you know, stories like trickle-down economics, right? Um, or the story of the separation from nature and the story of the separation from one another. But we don't have the stories to replace those stories or we're not listening to them, right? And that's sort of why in, 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 in my lecture I was talking about the, with the biggest problem I have with this idea that human nature causes climate change is that it denies that there are other ways of humans to organize themselves, right? It erases those different cosmologies and worldviews and narratives um, that we need to remember, recall, and be part of this process of retelling new stories that are going to help us survive. So I don't know, this is a long-winded answer to, I mean, a bit of a long-winded question, which was really sweet. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to take. I'm going to take one more, and this time it'll be from a woman. Oh yeah, um, women. Because I'm just trying to, you know, do the. <laughs> I'm sorry. Up here, I've been waiting for a while. Okay, who's been, who was that? Who was that? I'm up here at the balcony. Where are you? Over here. Okay. Hi. Wherever that dismembered voice is. Right there you are. are. You, please. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to yell. Um, no, you go for it. You go, girl. You... I'm curious. I'm in the middle of your book. Um, but in this lecture, I didn't hear you talk about the effects of agriculture and farming on climate change and how like, cattle farming in particular has quite an effect on the okay. environment. And I wanted to get your um, opinion, on that. opinion on that and quickly how you think lower economic society, poorer people on a global scale can be a part of this change and how they can be educated more about it or just in, involved in the right. process. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Final question. Hmm, wow, high stakes. Um, so, I... So I'm not sure I totally understood the last part of that question. Um, no, I think that uh, we, we often talk about this as a problem of sort of educating people. Um, and you know, I think a bigger problem, and I say this as somebody who's you know, very involved in the climate movement, is, um, is actually that the climate movement is not listening enough to the people who are most impacted. Um, by climate change and other ecological stresses um, and lifting up those voices. Because I think part of the reason why people have this perception that this is all far away and abstract is that they're always hearing about it from intermediaries, right? Um, you know, how often do we hear directly from people whose countries are disappearing? Um, so I don't think this is about us sort of enlightening the poor about this problem. I think we have a lot 
we have actually to, lead, to be enlightened. Um, and uh, the question about animal agriculture is an important one. It comes up uh, a lot these days because there's a documentary out there called Cowspiracy that says that animal agriculture is responsible for more emissions uh, than, uh, than fossil fuels, and that is incorrect, okay? This is based on one non-peer-reviewed paper. The New Internationalist did a wonderful piece about, about uh, some of the problems with that. But that said, um, Animal agriculture, industrial agriculture in general is a major contributor uh, to, to climate change. Um, and uh, in the LEAP, it's part of what we uh, are demanding in terms of transformations. Um, we need to shift to an agriculture system that is much less reliant on fossil fuel inputs, that reduces uh, the supply chains. I always encourage people to read Raj Patel on this, who's just brilliant. Um, Vandana Shiva, Soil Not Oil. So there's lots of great places to go on this. But I think some people get frustrated with me because I don't spend my lectures telling people how they can change their shopping and consumption. And it's not because I don't think it's important, because you know, there's absolutely a lot that we can do as individuals to lower our personal carbon footprints. Um, and that's important to do, to model the fact that changing is not the end of the world and that we will often be happier and healthier when we make these changes, including eating less or no meat. But I think this absolutist thing of like, you're not a climate activist if you eat meat. I mean, in, like in Canada, the most important alliances are with indigenous people, um, per, uh, exercising their land rights to keep carbon in the ground. And they're often doing it by protecting their hunting and fishing rights. Um, some of the most important alliances that have blocked pipelines have been between vegan activists and cattle ranchers. That's what blocked the Keystone XL pipeline, plus indigenous people. So just a little warning to be, you know, be a little careful about the sort of absolutism of any of it. I also think that it, um, it makes Shell really happy when we change the subject away from fossil fuels to our individual diets and so on. Um, I don't focus on the individual consumption, not because I don't think it's important, but because I, I, I think that the climate movement has spent a lot of time, you know, not less so recently since the fossil fuel divestment campaign started and since these, the big fights against fracking started, but the first phase of it was all about changing your light bulbs, changing your carbon footprint, buying carbon offsets, what are you going to do to save the world, you know, 50 things that you can buy to change the world, and so on. And this has been sort of a product of the neoliberal logic where we are trained to think of ourselves, first and foremost, as consumers, right? Um, uh, to, to, so, so we are confronted with this hugely complex global problem, and we're like, okay, but what can I buy, right? Um, and actually, we are not going to do this alone. That is the number one thing we have to understand. We're so much stronger when we're together, when we act in groups, and when we get out of our individual silos and build alliances and get powerful. That's how we win. Thank you, Shami. So, thank you. Good luck. <laughs> well, how wonderful to see such a generous and sweeping and ambitious lecture be rewarded by such an engaged audience and by those very generous and uh, expansive answers in return. Our city and perhaps our country has not been getting the best press lately. We, we look forward to happier times. But in the meantime, give a wonderful London welcome and thank you once more thank to you. Naomi Klein. Thank you.